Okay, very good. Good to see everyone this evening. Let's uh, open in a word of prayer and then we'll start. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word. We pray, Lord, that all that is said and done tonight would glorify you. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. First, I just want to thank uh, Richard for the opportunity to, to be here and to speak. It's a great privilege to present the Word of God, so thank you. Uh, secondly, I'd, I'd like to thank the Saints of Shorewood. Uh, putting on a Bible conference of this size is a tremendous undertaking and involves a lot of labor and hard work, and many of that is, is often un- unappreciated. And um, So thank you for that. There's a tremendous effort that is necessary to make these things happen, so thank you. Uh, if you would, then um, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. As Richard mentioned, my topic tonight is God's great mystery. Before we dig into that, I I want to deal with just um, an issue that um, you can never stress enough, and that is simply the issue of the gospel. So let me ask you this question. So if if you died tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? And if you do, that's, that's great. And if you don't, that's fine. We've all been in that position where we didn't know. Look with me at, at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You know, life on earth is confusing and complicated in the sense that modern life is very busy, right? So there's a million things that you have on your to-do list. There's a bunch of things you have to do for work. There's things at, at, at home that are broken. <laughs> I can't go beyond here. I imagine it's the same over here, right? <laughs> okay. Good to know. <laughs> By the way, this is a great room for preaching. You know why that is? There's no clock. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if you were coming hoping for me to quit early, you may be disappointed. Um, I'm sorry about that. But here's the point, right? Life is full of activity and motion, and that's even more true in a digital age, right? Because there's more information produced every day. And, of course, if you don't check Facebook every 15 minutes, you're out of touch with what's really going on. But, but life, you know, actually is, is quite simple. So look at me at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And, and I'll say this just in the context. Romans 3, 23, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So all of us together have the same shared problem of, one, we are sinners, and two, we deserve God's eternal wrath, which means we will spend eternity in one of two places, either heaven or hell. And the great tragedy of life, of course, is that many, many millions, billions, will end up in hell that didn't have to be there. So let's focus on how we can avoid that. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It has nothing to do with anything you would accomplish. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What Ephesians 2 tells you in multiple ways is that your salvation is not dependent upon, it's not based upon anything that you do. It is something that you obtain by grace as a gift. Now, what we have today, of course, on TV is there's these infomercials, and they say free, right? And the one thing they do not mean is free, right? Because if it was truly free, they wouldn't make money, and they use free in a way that's perverted. But the way that God uses the term free or uses the term grace or uses the term gift is that it is 100% free, and it is 100% separate from any merit or any works that, that you or I have. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. So what what Ephesians 2 told us is we're saved by grace. It's a gift through faith. It's by believing something. It's not of ourselves. It's not our merit, not our resume, not our water baptism, not our church membership. It is the gift of God. And then verse 9 said, not of works, lest any man should boast. What we need to have faith in is contained in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news. Verses 3 and 4 define what the good news is. When you read verses 3 and 4, it tells you that the very definition of what the gospel is for today has nothing to do with anything you or I do, because it is 100% what Christ did. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He did all of these things before you even existed, right? So your, your works, your merit is adding nothing to that. What we need to have faith in is simply what verses 3 and 4 says, that Christ did, in fact, die for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. 
the instant, the moment that you believe that, you are eternally saved and you cannot lose it. You are saved in a moment. You're not saved as part of a process. You're not saved by the collective works that you do. Look with me at Titus 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Now, if you actually look at that in the Greek, what that will mean is that it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. (laughs) But praise the Lord, he gave you the King James Bible, which saves us a lot of time. Um, One thing I'll say on that, just FYI. When you hear Greek scholars on the radio or TV or elsewhere correct the King James Bible, One of the things you should think about is this. If you go to seminary and you spend a number of years there and you study Greek every year that you're there, right? And then let's say you get a PhD, so you spend, you know, an additional four or five years there. So add that up. However many years that is, six, seven, whatever it is, think about this. If you have a high school degree in the United States, what that means is you have been taught English 12 years, right? You learned science in English, in the English language, right? You wrote your shopping lists in English. You posted on Facebook in English. You conversed in English on a daily basis. And you are not a scholar of the English language simply because you graduated from high school, right? And you've had more indoctrination in the English language than the average Greek scholar. Think about that. Those are the folks that are correcting the King James Bible and telling you it should be changed. So I would just stay with the English, but that's me. Titus 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Again, the point there is that you are saved not by works, but by grace. Now get Romans 11, 6. Here is my greatest fear with regard to the gospel. Now maybe I'm wrong on this, but here's my greatest fear, and that's this. Many people know as, as a fact or as a, as a point of information, that Christ died for people's sins. But what they typically are doing is they are trusting in what Christ did and also what they do. It's both. Notice what Romans 11.6 says about that. Romans 11.6, And if by grace, then is it no more of works, Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. Grace and works, according to that verse, are what? They're mutually exclusive or they're opposites, right? And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. In other words, if you take grace and you add one work to it, what does it cease to be according to that verse? It ceases to be grace. Now, here's why this matters. When you, when you talk to folks about the gospel, what you find is folks have an intellectual understanding that Christ died for their sins, but they are trusting in that plus their church membership, in that plus their water baptism, in that plus they're a good person, in that plus turning over a new leaf. And listen, any time you add a work to the gospel, you frustrate grace according to that verse. When Jesus Christ said on the cross, it is finished, it was finished. There was nothing left to be done to pay for sin. Here's the the reality, and I just just emphasize this because I I, I fear about this. If what you're doing in your heart is you're trusting Christ, but it's really him plus something you've done, you haven't really rested in God's grace. You're, You're relying upon your works. And so what you need to do to resolve the heaven and hell issue is you need to trust alone in what Christ did for you. That, that his death on the cross for your sins, his burial and resurrection, by itself was sufficient, and you can add nothing to that. Amen? Amen. So that's the gospel that saves you today. And, and, and please, if you have any questions about that, get with someone and ask. But you, you, need, to, you need to not miss heaven. I mean, the more you read about hell in the Bible, it's just absolutely stark and, and, and horrible and awful, and you don't want to be there. And the sad reality of everyone today that ends up in hell... That they go there and they didn't have to because Christ paid for their sins. And the problem is they've rejected that and they've relied upon their own righteousness. So don't, don't make that mistake, friends. All right, so let's, let's now turn and um, 
Get with me if you would, Galatians 2. We're going to talk about God's great mystery, and I have only two points. But since I'm a grace preacher, it'll take me an hour and a half to make those. So um, I'm sorry about that. Um, There are two points I want to make tonight, and that's simply this. The first is this, that God kept a secret, the mystery, the dispensation of grace, and we'll look at that. And then second, we're going to look at the issue of why he kept it a secret. He had a specific purpose. So let me introduce point one, the the fact that God kept a secret by, by saying this. The core flaw of nearly all non-dispensational thinking is to make the ministry of Peter and Paul the same. And so as you, as you look about at what most of churchianity does, they will look at Peter's ministry and Paul's ministry, and they'll just look at them and say those two things are the same. What they'll do is they'll look at the information that's contained in the Gospels, and they'll Try to reconcile that, try to harmonize that with what Paul said. Look with me at Galatians 2, if you would, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. That verse is so offensive to people that when they make new Bible versions, they change the verse. And it's because what they've, what they've been taught, they have this idea, there's only one gospel throughout the Bible, and so the notion that there's more than one gospel is in and of itself a heresy. So that verse obviously has to be changed, because that verse says there's more than one gospel, doesn't it? Peter and Paul have different gospels according to that verse. Get with me, if you would, Luke 7, and compare it with 1 Corinthians. Luke chapter 7. Now, as we turn there, we're talking about the subject tonight of rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 commands us to rightly divide the word of truth, and hence there must be divisions in it. Now, if you think about this for a moment, you you realize that you do this all the time. So, for example, before the flood, when God said to Noah there's going to be a flood, was that a true statement? It was. After the flood, when God said, I'm not going to flood the earth anymore, was that a true statement? Yes, it was a true statement. But was the content of those statements different? One says, I'm going to flood the earth. One says, I'm not going to flood the earth. They're both true because they're made at different points in time where God's dealings are different. So the Bible at times, it doesn't contradict itself, but it says different things to different people in different circumstances. Well, look at Luke 7, verse 29. Now, there's many that believe that today you need to be water baptized in order to be saved. Luke 7, 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So what Luke 7.30 clearly indicates is that the individuals that were being spoken to at that time, when they rejected the water baptism, what were they doing? They were rejecting the counsel of God. They were rejecting the word of God by the mere act of refusing water baptism. Contrast that. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Now, as you look at 1 Corinthians 1 17, Tell me if this is something that John the Baptist could have said. 1 Corinthians 1.17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now think about what that says. Is water baptism part of Paul's gospel? If he says he didn't send me to baptize, but sent me to preach the gospel, then the gospel cannot contain water baptism, right? I mean, that's obvious. Now, here's the multiple choice question. This is going to be tricky, so you're going to have to really think through this. John the Baptist really cared about A, macaroni and cheese, B, the Lord's Supper, or C, water baptism. C, water baptism, right? I mean, that's sort of how he got his name, right? Now, if you think about that for a minute, you realize that the, 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 the essence of the ministry of John the Baptist and the essence of, the, of Paul's ministry are fundamentally different, right? Right? Because Paul says, I was sent to preach the gospel, and it has nothing to do with water baptism. But turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians 3. We're going to spend a lot of time in Ephesians 3. And while you're turning there, let me just sort of make this point. If you make Peter and Paul have the same ministry, then what you naturally end up doing, what you unavoidably end up doing, is you end up taking a square peg and a round hole and trying to make them fit together because they say different things in different places. And what happens is you'll lose 
not only the distinctive nature of Peter's ministry, but you'll lose the distinctive nature of Paul's ministry, and you'll lose, you'll not understand what it is that God is doing today. So as we think about this issue, what we need to be able to demonstrate, it seems to me, is that Paul had new information. If indeed Paul had new information that was new, then it must be different from Peter, right? Because if it's new, it has to be different. If he's teaching the exact same thing, it's not new. So as we spend some time in Ephesians 3, what I'd like you to do is just focus on how many times the passage is telling you that Paul has new information. So Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. Now what people typically say about dispensationalism is it was invented in the 1800s, right? Whether you think it's Bollinger, Schofield, Larkin, Darby, you know, pick whichever name you like and say, okay, this man invented it at this time and it's just the creation of men. Well, what Ephesians 3 just showed you is the word dispensation was there in 1611, but guess what? It was actually there in the first century when the Holy Spirit wrote it. Dispensationalism wasn't invented in the 1800s. It may have been noticed or observed or popularized, but it wasn't created then. It was always in the Word of God. Now, notice what verse 2 says. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given, and what's the next word? Well, that's a small word. You can ignore that one, right? (laughs) Or what it's telling you is who was it given to? It was given to Paul. And if it was distinctively given to Paul, then obviously it wasn't given prior to that. Look at verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. What verse 3 tells us is that Paul received the mystery by revelation. He didn't receive it from men. God gave it to him specifically. Now, keep Ephesians 3, but notice with me 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. The Bible frequently defines its own terms, and the mystery is an example of a term that is defined in the Bible. First Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Notice this. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. What the word mystery means is it's wisdom, but it's wisdom that is hidden. And so it's hidden for a period of time until it is revealed. So the mystery that we're going to be talking about this evening and and all this week is something that was concealed. It was hid by God until the point in time where he decided to reveal it. Go back to Ephesians 3 and and pick up in verse 4. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, verse 5 which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, the first thing to notice in verse 5 is this. In other ages, it was not made known. So, obviously, it had to have been concealed uh, at least to a certain point in time. Now, some may look at this and they may say the following. Well, look what it says, though. As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles, plural, and prophets by the Spirit. So, Maybe it just wasn't known in the Old Testament, and now it's known in the New Testament, and maybe it wasn't known by people in the Old Testament, but it, it was known by the Twelve, right? So if you, took, if you took a non-dispensational point of view, and you wanted to say that Peter and Paul are doing the same thing, you'd look at the verse that way, and you'd say, well, yeah, it wasn't known in the Old Testament, but it's known in the New Testament, and Peter was teaching it. But, but notice this with me, if you would. We're going to back up to verse 3. And we're going to read from verse 3 down to 4 to 5 to 6 to get the flow of it. And notice what this passage is telling us. So start in verse 3 again, if you would. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. So we have the mystery there where we see it in verse 3. And we're going to see a parenthesis. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Close parenthesis. Now notice this. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. So verse 5 modifies the mystery, and it says the mystery wasn't known in other ages, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Notice what verse 6 says. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. The that in verse 6 defines what the mystery is in verse 3. 
When verse 3 uses the word mystery, it connects directly down to verse 6, and it's the fact that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So notice this. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and of the same body. We're going to look at what that means. I'll submit to you, I'll argue to you, that the twelve did not know or preach the mystery during the Gospels. So get with me Matthew 10. And in fact, that information that we saw there was so just simply not known, and the Lord had to make it known by subsequent revelation. So get Matthew 10 if you would. As people think about the Old Testament and the New Testament, they think that when they get to Matthew 1, well, the New Testament started, and all of this is for me. Look what Matthew 10, verse 5 says. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, is that for you today? I mean, think about that. Look with me at Matthew 15. What Matthew 10 tells you is that the ministry that the Lord gave to the apostles during his earthly ministry was directed to the nation of Israel. It did not include Gentiles. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Whatever you do, don't go to Gentiles. Look with me at Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verse 22. Matthew 15, 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan, so this is a Gentile woman, came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Notice what the Lord says in verse 23. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel which is exactly consistent with what he said in Matthew 10. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. What did he just say there? Was that nice? I mean, it, it has to be nice in the sense that the Lord is not mean, but it is specific and blunt, isn't it? I mean, he's saying to the woman, you're a Gentile dog and I can't take the blessings of the children of Israel and give them to you because what was being done at that time did not involve Gentiles being directly blessed. Verse 27, and she said, why, Lord, you have offended me. I'm sorry. (laughs) And she said, truth, Lord, because she recognized that as a true statement of what God was doing at that time. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. That's that's a clear explanation of how God was interacting with the earth, and specifically Gentiles, during that time. Now, here's what people will say. Get Matthew 28. Matthew 28 is the so-called Great Commission. Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And so many will grab verse 19 and say, Look, that is a commission to Gentiles. You need to think about if that's what that's saying or not. Because Matthew 10 wasn't. Matthew 15 wasn't. Are you going to tell me that Acts 2 is? Have you read Acts 2? So did in the middle of all this, is there a Gentile commission? Or is this possibly telling us something else? Look with me, if you would, Luke 24. Now, Luke 24 is written in the same time frame as Matthew 28, so I would tell you that it's relevant for understanding what Matthew 28 is saying. Luke 24, verse... 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. And then notice what it says. 
among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So were the kingdom saints to go unto all nations? They were according to that verse. Among all nations. Get with me Mark 13. Let me show you a couple verses and we'll try to tie this together. Now, by the way, the verses we're looking at, where is Israel at that time? Where are the Israelite people? If you think about where they are, they have been scattered among all nations. Hadn't they? So think of Exodus. God brings Israel, his firstborn, out of Egypt, and he brings them into the promised land, right? And then Israel does exactly what God says for the next 2,000 years. No, Israel doesn't. So Israel departs from the Lord, and what happens as a consequence of their departure from the Lord? Well, do they get split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom? Does the northern kingdom go into apostasy and, and become taken over by Gentile nations? Does the southern kingdom get taken over by Gentile nations because of their disobedience? Yes. And does Israel end up being scattered out of its land? Israel does. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, the problem is God brings Israel into the land. Israel's disobedient. Israel ends up conquered and then being dispersed. So when it talks about among all nations, that's where the Israelites are that need to hear the kingdom gospel. Look with me at Mark 13, verse 10. And the gospel must first be published. What does it say? Among all nations, because that's where the people are that need to hear it. Look with me at Acts 2. Now, I realize it's very common today for folks to say, well, the birthplace of the church is in Acts 2. The church of today started then. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but Acts 2 is the Jewish feast of Pentecost described in Leviticus. It occurs in Jerusalem. The people that are attending are Jews and proselytes. When Peter stands up with the 11, he quotes the prophet Joel. Is that the birth of the body of Christ? And it's anything but. It's the continuation of the church that was established in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Notice Acts chapter 2, verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men. Then what does it say? Out of every nation under heaven. So the folks that are in Jerusalem for Pentecost are obviously Jews. That's what the verse told you. But what is their nationality? They're from all the nations because that's where the Jews were scattered. Do you see that? I mean, am I making that up or is that what the verse says? Out of every nation which is under heaven. So if, if you wanted to preach the kingdom gospel to all of the Jews on the earth, where would you have to go? You have to go to every nation because according to Acts 2 verse 5, there are Jews scattered among every nation. That's what's going on. Matthew 28 is not a commission to go to Gentiles. It's a commission to go to the Jews that have been scattered among the different nations. So let me make this point a little further. Get Acts 10 if you would. So let's say you don't believe any of that. And that what you really think is that in the Gospels they were going to Gentiles and that in early Acts the Twelve understood they were supposed to go to Gentiles and the ministry was always to every man alike. What do you do with Acts 10? So look with me if you would. Verse 9. On the morrow as they went on their journey, these are some Gentiles that are coming to see Peter. And drew nigh unto the city. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven to open and a certain vessel descending unto him. As it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners let down in the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice. Verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Let's just make sure we understand what's going on here. Peter who obviously is a Jew and who is observing the Old Testament law, has a vision that tells him to eat unclean animals. And it tells him to eat them three times. And you know why Peter doubts what the vision means? Because for the last 2,000 years, what have Jews been taught? 
don't eat unclean animals. So he gets a vision saying, eat unclean animals. And he's puzzled by that. So then, as this happens, look at this, verse 17. Now, where Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So right as he gets this vision, some Gentiles show up. Now, notice this. We're not going to read this entire thing, but look at verse 28. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, are you going to tell me that the twelve were going to Gentiles when in Acts 10, after the fact, Peter says it is unlawful for a Jew to go into one of another nation? Do you see the problem? I mean, to say that the twelve were going unto Gentiles is insanity. Peter says as late as Acts 10 that that would be an unlawful thing to do. Notice what he then says. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. When did he show him that? Right there in Acts 10. So think about that. In Acts 2, when Peter stands up and speaks by the power of the Holy Spirit and says exactly what he says, he has no idea that Gentiles are going to be cleansed because none of the earthly ministry was about Gentiles being cleansed. The Lord Jesus Christ never told him to go into Gentiles. In fact, he told him specifically not to. You see my point? Now think about this. Go back with me, if you would, to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, notice verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Now, do you see how that can't possibly be what the 12 said? There's no way the 12 believed that because in Acts 10, Peter has to have a vision from the Lord to tell him Gentiles have been cleansed. He didn't believe they were part of the same body. You see the point? What you cannot do, here's my point. What you cannot do in Ephesians 3, seems to me legitimately, is to say, oh, yeah, this mystery that Jew and Gentile are in the same body, that's what Peter was preaching. That's what the 12 were preaching. They were doing the exact opposite of that. So you're in Ephesians 3, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. That's different information. Get with me Galatians 3 and Colossians 3. Galatians 3, 28. For the sake of time, we'll just read Galatians 3, 28. Notice what this says about the body of Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Is that something the Lord Jesus Christ would have said in Matthew 10? Is that something Peter would have said? No, because Galatians 3 is revelation that was given to Paul that was not known before that time. Amen? All right, go back to Ephesians 3. Let's look at verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Get John 5. John chapter 5. Verse 38. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. What Jesus Christ is doing in in John 5 is he's dealing with some folks that are unbelievers. Notice carefully what he says in verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. In John 5, Jesus Christ is dealing with some unbelievers. These unbelievers nonetheless claim to believe the Old Testament. So what Christ says to them very appropriately is, look, you guys claim to believe the Old Testament, but you don't really. Because if you really believe the Old Testament and you searched it, who would it point to? It would point to me and you would believe on me. In other words, what Jesus Christ did in John 5 when he's dealing with folks that that don't believe, he points them to the Old Testament scriptures and says, search them because those point to me. 
If you were someone who was alive during Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John during the Gospels, and you believe the Old Testament, when Christ showed up, you'd be like, fantastic. This is exactly what prophecy said would happen. We're thrilled. But Paul says the exact opposite. Ephesians 3, 8, what kind of riches did he preach? They were unsearchable because they were, could not be searched out in the Old Testament. They couldn't be searched out in the Old Testament because they weren't there. There was no there there. Now, notice with me, go back uh, to Ephesians 3, and let's see why it was unsearchable. Ephesians chapter 3, notice verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. It wasn't hid in the Old Testament, it was hid in God. And the reason why no one could find it is... What God hides, you can't find, right? It's not like us, you know. Here's, here's the, the reality is when we have secrets, you tell someone and then someone else knows is sort of the way life works. Sorry to burst any bubbles for you, but that is the way life works. Uh, but when God decided to keep something a secret, what happened, of course? It stayed secret for thousands of years until it got to the precise time God wanted it revealed. So just, I'm going to go back through Ephesians 3 just for a moment, but just notice this. So verse 2, Paul's given the dispensation of the grace of God. It was given me. Verse 3, he got it by revelation. It's said to be a mystery. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known. Verse 8 says it's unsearchable. Verse 9 says it was hidden God. Now, my point is, if you come to Ephesians 3 legitimately and you just believe what it says, does Paul have new information or does he not? I mean, isn't the overwhelming testimony of Ephesians 3 that God is doing something new and different? And if that is the case, I mean, here's, here's sort of I, what I think is the reality. Ephesians 3 forces you to be one of two things. You either should be a mid-Acts dispensationalist and believe that Paul had new information, or you just don't believe the text of the Bible. There's really no third option. Because Ephesians 3 says six different ways Paul had something new. Now get with me, if you would, Second Peter. So you can't read Paul and get the idea that he's preaching the same thing as Peter. And what I would say to you is you can't read Peter and get the idea he's re- preaching the same thing as Paul. 2 Peter 3, verse 16. Here's what Peter says about Paul. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, notice, in which are some things hard to be understood. Listen, if Paul is simply saying the exact same thing Peter did, why wouldn't Peter understand it? right i mean the whole point of second peter is paul had to be saying something different or else peter would have said yeah i got that i would preach that 10 years before you buddy right so here's the point what all of that demonstrates is that paul had information that was new and different the reason why most bible study is a completely closed book and completely pointless is that people do not recognize that Paul had new and different information. They take his revelation, they try to shoehorn it and make it the same as Peter's, and they make the New Testament just a dead book. Let me put it another way. Think about this. If God inspired a book and preserved it, do you think he cared about what it said? Or did he just put some things in there that were close and sort of spiritually true and partially uplifting? Or did he he bother to record the very words he wanted? You see what I mean? And, and, And the point is, if God went to all that trouble, it's very, very likely, in fact, it is certain, that he has the book in the form he wants it to be. And it says exactly what he wants it to say. And so what we need to be doing is not correcting it or helping fix it for him, but believing it. And when you believe the words on the page, you will have to recognize Paul had new and different information. Amen? So that's point one. Let's talk about point two. Yeah, I know. And and point two is the long one. So turn with me to Judges. Now, that's, it's a dirty trick. You know, a grace preacher stands up and says you have to use the Old Testament. It's not allowed. So this is going to be a longer answer, but let me just sort of 
introduce it by saying this. What we want to understand is why did God keep this a secret? So it's clear that God had a mystery that he hid in himself until the particular time he wanted to reveal it. Why did he bother to do that? What would be the point? Judges chapter 7, verse 2. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Verse 3, Now therefore go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead, and there return to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remain ten thousand. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Gideon, By three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man unto his own place. Now I'm going through this quickly, but here's what I want you to get. In Judges 7, Gideon is going to be sent off to do battle. And he goes with an army of 32,000. And God says, wait, wait, wait a minute. That's way too many. If I send you out with 32,000, you're going to think you did it by your own strength. So he first gets rid of 22. He gets rid of two-thirds of the army. And he says, no, that's too much. Then he leaves him with 300. So he went from 32,000 to 300. And then my favorite part, look at verse 16. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Here's the best part. He gets rid of 99% of the army and says, look, you guys don't need weapons. What you need is a torch and a (laughs) noisemaker. Right? So we're going to attack in the night, hold up the torch so they can see you, blow the trumpet so they can identify your location, and they can shoot at you. Right? (laughs) This is literally the worst plan ever. Right? There is no commander that says, yeah, that sounds spot on. That's exactly what I want to do. But what's the point? The point is it's not man, right? I'm going to send you with too few men and no armaments and a way to get slaughtered. And what happens? The Midianites destroy themselves. And I tell you that to say what the Old Testament is about. It is about the conclusive demonstration of God's power. So he sends Gideon off to do battle there and says, you know, I'm going to give you battle despite these things. Look with me at Romans 4. Romans chapter 4. Verse 19. Romans 4, 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So think about what God's doing with Abraham. God's going to make of Abraham a great nation. And so what does he, of course, do? Well, he waits till Abraham's too old, until Sarah can't have children, and he says, now it's time. <laughs> right? Now, listen, if you and I were doing things, we would never do it that way, right? Because it's just, it's not going to work. Except that if God wanted it to work that way, it would. So he waits until when when when... When Sarah is told she's going to have a child, what does she end up doing? She laughs because it's absurd, right? She looks at it from human viewpoint. She's like, this is what we've been asking for for years, Lord. Now you say this. That's a good one. Now, it was wrong of her to be that way. But from a human perspective, do you understand why she did? Because she looked at it and says, it's not going to happen. And God said, okay, since you're convinced it's not going to happen, now it can Because the Old Testament is 100% about the demonstration of God's power. It's not man doing it. It's God doing it. Let me give you one more example. Get 1 Samuel 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. So in 1 Samuel 4, Israel is battling with the Philistines. Verse 2. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. So Israel obviously is smitten. Verse 7. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. And what happens is they bring the ark of the Lord into the Philistine camp. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. What I want you to notice, in in verse 2, the Philistines had this significant military victory. They capture the ark, and their reaction when capturing the ark is fear. Because they realize they've captured the ark of the nation that was brought out of Egypt, and they're fearful as to what's going to happen to them. So verse 10, here's what the Philistines do. 
And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his own tent, and there was a very great slaughter. For their fellow of Israel, 30,000 footmen. So the Philistines have an even greater victory. Verse 11, and the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. So the Philistines have obviously won the victory. They've captured the spoils of war. They've captured the ark. Notice what then happens. Verse uh, chapter 5. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So here's, this is great. <laughs> so the Philistines have won the victory. They've got the spoils of the war. And they're going to take the ark and they're going to set it up before their god, Dagon. Right? And it's in Dagon's temple. And so this is an example of how their god is a great god. Right? Because the, the, the God that's been defeated, his ark is there, right? Verse 3. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Now listen, is that the Israelites sneaking in in the night and pulling a fast one? It's not because they can't even win in battle, right? What happens is Dagon falls down, and the keeper's going to notice, oops, <laughs> our idol is bowing down to the ark. We better set him back up. So they put him back up. Then notice what happens. Verse 4. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of it, Dagon, was left to him. So they set him back up the first time, and what happens? He falls down again. Now, just notice for a minute, if you're one of the keepers in the Philistine temple, do you sort of figure out what's going on here? In other words, you know that there was not an intruder that did this. There must be the true God of heaven that is causing this to happen. Verse 8. Then sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. So what happens is their first choice is not to send it back to Israel. Let's send it to a different Philistine city. You know, in other words, uh, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Maybe you should when they're saying, hey, listen, we're going to bring the ark of the Lord into your city. Right? <laughs> we don't like all the things that have befallen us. We'd like to give some of them to you. <laughs> Verse 10. Therefore, they sent the ark of the God to Ekron, and it came to pass, as the ark of the God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. <laughs> They're scared of it, aren't they? Verse 11, So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place, that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy, therefore was very heavy there. I'm sorry. Now, here's my point. I'm going to wrap this up and move on. What's going on there is Israel obviously has no military power, right? They fought the Philistines multiple times. They kept getting beat on. The Philistines capture the ark, and what happens is, although it's the spoils of war they can keep, they decide the best thing we can do, let's return it nicely and promise not to do it again, and maybe he'll quit beating on us. What is going on in the Old Testament, friends, simply is this. God is using the physical circumstances that are on the earth to make clear Israel is not receiving blessings because of Israel's own goodness or anything like that. It is God's power bringing those things about. Okay? Now, the contrast I want to give you is this. While the prophecy program is about God's power, the mystery program is about God's wisdom. And you can see that if from nothing else, the very definition of what a mystery is, a mystery is hidden wisdom. So as we look at what the mystery is, it's about God's wisdom. Get Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. What we want to look at next for a little bit is we want to look at some things about Lucifer's rebellion. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And then you'll see in verse 13 that this king of Tyrus was in Eden, the garden of God, and this appears to be a, a reference to, to Lucifer himself. 
So what we see from this is that Lucifer as created was full of wisdom. He was perfect in beauty. Notice verse 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So Lucifer was created perfect, but he had a problem. What is the problem that Lucifer had, friends? Pride, exactly. That's 1 Timothy 3, 6. We won't turn there. But his problem was pride. Keep Ezekiel, but get with me 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians one, I'm sorry. First Corinthians chapter eight, chapter eight, verse one. I'm sorry. First Corinthians eight one. There's something here that happens to Lucifer, and there's something here that it would be good for us to be reminded of as well. First Corinthians eight one. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Then notice this. What does knowledge do? Puffeth up, but charity edifieth. As grace believers, we, we, we tend to be serious about the scriptures. Hopefully we are. We tend to be serious about learning doctrine and, and understanding things that are in the word of God, and that, that's a good thing. But guess what comes with that? Anytime that you have knowledge, you know what you're likely to have with it? You like to have pride. And we saw, that, we saw that with Lucifer. But we would do well to remember that that is true for us as well. Knowledge puffeth up, but what? Charity edifieth. And by the way, you know, it's very easy to be a, a dispensationalist and, and, and draw the chart and so on, but to have no charity in the way that you do things, right? I mean, it, let, me, let me put it this way. Is what's going to happen is we get to the judgment seat of Christ, and the Lord says, take out a piece of paper and draw the chart, and whoever draws the nicest chart gets the most rewards. Is that what it is? And that's not what it is at all. In fact, the, the real issue is, is not how much you know. The real issue is how much you practice what you know. I mean, is God's design to just give you a bunch of head knowledge and then you can be a mean, judgmental person that corrects everyone? By the way, you know, there are grace folks that think it is their ministry to tell other people what they're doing wrong. That is their function. Listen, the the purpose of, of rightly dividing the word of truth is so that you can understand what God would have you to do that you might resemble Christ in your actions, right? That In other words, that the life of Christ might live in you. The life you now live, you live by the faith of the Son of God. And it's not, it's not just information, it's living it out. So that it makes a difference in the people around your, your lives. Amen? Amen? Look with me at, at verse 2. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, what, what, what actually is the case? He knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So as we think about the, the issues of knowledge and wisdom, I would just, I think it's highly relevant for folks that are Bible students. Hey, one of the greatest dangers you're going to face is pride. And you always need to be on, on, on guard about that. So turn back with me to Ezekiel 28, if you would. We want to see one more thing about Lucifer before we go on. Ezekiel 28, notice verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. And that's, again, a description. This is a description of the Prince of Tyrus, but, again, I think it's analogous to, to Lucifer. Now, here's the point. Satan has been given this great wisdom, this knowledge that it was imparted to him from God. And what happens is he doesn't think that he can overpower God. Because, what, you know, if you think about what God does, out of nothing, he creates everything, including Lucifer. So in terms of, of, of power, there's no comparison. But what he seems to have, as best I can tell, is he seems to have the vain hope that he can somehow use his knowledge to figure out what God is doing and manipulate the circumstances of creation so that they benefit him. In other words, he thinks he's going to be somehow be able to, to outsmart or outwit God. And if you think about sort of going back to the military analogy, are there times when a lesser force, a force that has lesser military power, wins by having a superior strategy? And that does happen, right, if you have a better plan. So Satan's idea here is the point is he's not going to overpower God. God is the creator God that created everything. But his hope is that he can manipulate creation so that it serves him. Get Deuteronomy 29. We now want to look at some verses as to how God gives knowledge. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, 
But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. What that verse tells you is that the secret things belong to God, and man can only possess that which God has decided to reveal. Get with me Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Now, here's what's fascinating about that passage. You would think that if God had revealed something so that a babe could get it, well, then the wise would surely be smart enough to. But what that verse is actually saying is God's control over the revelation of truth is that he has such specific control that he can choose to reveal it unto babes and the wise won't have any idea. See, that? they're just not smart enough to figure it out. Look at me at 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Verse ten. But God hath revealed them unto us, notice, by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What that tells us is that God reveals truth by his spirit. Man's attempts to understand spiritual truth on man's own efforts are doomed to failure because you can only get it by the spirit of God. You're not going to get it on your own. You're not going to get it by your own wisdom. Notice verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Again, you can't know anything you can't know anything about God except the Spirit of God reveal it to you. Now, I want to I make a point here that's just fascinating and, I don't know, sort of troubling maybe a little bit. But get Ecclesiastes 12, if you would. Keep 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to come back to this. But get Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So what happens to man when he dies? Where does the Spirit part of his being go? It returns unto God, doesn't it? Now think about that, if you would. So we know that man is a, a body, soul, spirit. We just learned from Ecclesiastes that when a man dies, the Spirit part of him returns unto God. Think with me, if you would, get Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, verse 24. And they shall go forth. This is... Uh, appears to be during the millennium, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. That's just a terrifying way to phrase that. Then notice what it says, for their what? Their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Isaiah 66 is a description of the lost in hell. Let me just pause here and make sure we, we get the picture before we move on. A man is body, soul, and spirit. We know that. The part of you that is unalterably you, the part of you that's fundamentally you is your soul. What shall it profit man if he gain the whole world yet lose his soul? Ecclesiastes 12 told us that when a man dies, the spirit returns unto the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2 just told us, for how shall a man know the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? So if a man loses the sp his spirit, what he loses is he loses that consciousness, that ability to know the things of a man. Right? Isaiah 66 just told us about the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. And then it says, for their what? Worm. Worm. 
shall not die. You ever ponder what a great body you have? Well, let me, uh, okay. <laughs> let me clarify. You have fingers and, and thumbs that are opposable, right? They allow you to type and play the piano. And they give you great dexterity. I mean, they're designed to be very effective, efficient, functional bodies. That was my point, okay? Now, think about the body of a worm. It's primitive, useless. So what seems to happen in Isaiah 66 is that the lost man, what happens to him, and this goes back to the first point we talked about tonight about the importance of the gospel, what, what seems to happen to the lost man in hell is he has no, no spirit of God. He has no consciousness of the things of God. He loses the spirit of man, so he doesn't even have the mentality, if you will, of what it means to be a man. He's lost that, and what he has is this body that has been reduced from even the, what we have here to something that is more like that of what? A worm. Now, I realize that what happens is as people... You know, every year they do this. They do surveys, and they ask people, how many people believe in heaven, how many people believe in hell? And every year there's more people that believe in heaven than believe in hell, which never made any sense to me. But what happens is we have this very sort of, oh, I don't know, optimistic, naive view that hell isn't so bad and there's some escape clause and something like that. And listen, the truth of the matter is the exact opposite. Number one, hell is real. Number two, there is no escape. And number three, it is actually much worse than what we think it is. It's not simply hot. Right? In other words, what the verses tell you is that what happens to the lost man is such an eternal destruction and degradation of his person that it's horrific. The spiritual component of the being is lost. Even the body is reduced to a primitive form, which emphasizes the point, number one, get saved. Number two, the importance of the gospel that, that we preach, right? Back to 1 Corinthians 2, if you would. First Corinthians 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Notice that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. What all those verses have demonstrated is simply this. You don't understand spiritual truth by being clever, by figuring it out by your intelligence. It's by the fact that God reveals it to you. And if he doesn't, you just don't know is the point. Look with me at, at Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? And the answer is obviously no one. Or who hath been his counselor? What this is telling us is that God's wisdom is unsearchable. No one can know it. No one can know the mind of God. Get 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy 1, verse 17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible. Notice this. The only wise God. So is there any other like him? No, there's not. Get Job 39. Job 39. Job 39, verse 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth, and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is, is in vain without fear. Why? Notice verse 17. Because God hath deprived her of wisdom. Neither hath he imparted to her understanding. So what science does today is whenever they find animals in nature that do amazing things. So, for example, there's some birds and dogs where you can take them 200 miles from home and you drop them off and what do they do? They run back home. 
and there's actually adults that can't do that, right? <laughs> I mean, before smartphones, a lot of folks would still be wandering. Um, how do the animals do that? Well, science doesn't have any explanation, so they call it instinct. Well, Job 39 is the answer. What God has done with animals in creation is to different ones, he has given to them different levels of wisdom and understanding that allow them to do certain things. The poor ostrich, what did he do? He deprived it of wisdom so the ostrich doesn't have any sense and it takes its eggs and leaves it in the sand where they get crushed. The point is, what this is telling you is the nature of all created beings is they are dependent upon God for wisdom and knowledge. If he doesn't give it to them, they don't have it. Luke 22. So now let's talk about what God is doing with the mystery and why he kept it a secret. Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Was Satan in favor of the cross? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, he's so in favor of the cross that if you want a job done right, do it yourself. So he doesn't say to one of his minions, hey, look, go betray the Lord. He says, you know, I want this done right. He enters into Judas. He wants the cross to happen. Right? He clearly does. Luke 22. Get with me Matthew 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Is that a mystery? That's not a mystery. The fact that Christ was going to die for Israel and save Israel from their sins was not a mystery, and Satan knew it, and was even so in favor of the cross. Get John 2. John chapter 2. Verse 19, John 2, 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And verse 21, just in case we're unclear, but he spake of the temple of his body. So this is before the cross. Again, it's not a mystery. Here's what I want you just to notice. Satan was in favor of the cross in Luke 22. He was so in favor of it that he entered into Judas to make sure it would happen, even knowing that it would redeem Israel, he was in favor of it, and even knowing about the resurrection, he was in favor of it, right? So when the cross occurs, he's like, that's exactly what I want. Get with me 1 Corinthians 2. 1 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Before God even created the world, the mystery was there. It was not plan B. It was not a contingency plan. It was always what God intended. Verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, and that includes Satan, by the way, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So God, by keeping the mystery a secret, Satan did something that Satan otherwise would not have done. Get 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So when people scheme to outwit God, what happens? They themselves are trapped because they're just not smart enough to know what they should be doing. Look with me at Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Notice verse 15. And having spoiled, in other words, he defeated them and plundered them. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them. What's the next word? Openly triumphing over them in it. 
If you haven't gotten this question yet, you will. If dispensationalism is true, then why don't more people believe it? Amen. Right? Really dumb question, right? I mean, what if you went up to Noah right before the flood? You said, Noah, look, man, we took an opinion poll, and 99% of people think you're an idiot, <laughs> right? There is no flood. Like, this is just some government building project run amok. You're wasting time. There's no point to this. And, of course, what happens? Truth is not determined by a majority vote, right? What Colossians 2 actually tells you is why there aren't more people that believe the mystery. Because what Colossians 2 says is what God did is this. He took those principalities and powers that were opposed to them, and he did what? He spoiled them. Did he win? He won. And then he made a show of them openly. How do you think Satan felt about that? In other words, he's on Sports Center and he's not on the good side of the highlight. Right? He's not the one dunking, he's the one getting dunked on. He made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan is the God of this world. How does the God of this world feel about the mystery when what the mystery is is his humiliation? It's no wonder people don't believe the mystery. It's no wonder the mystery is mocked. The God of this world detests it. Now get Ephesians 3. Verse 10. Let's read verse 9 and 10 together to get the, the full context. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Do we have a responsibility to make men see? Yes, we do. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Not the end of a sentence, so look at verse 10. To the intent. We make all men see, but there is a greater intent. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold what? Wisdom of God. So what God is doing today is he is using the body of Christ to demonstrate under those principalities and powers in heavenly places his wisdom. Isn't that something? Now, by the way, even after the mystery was made known and revealed unto Paul, did God then go tell Satan? Or is his plan for Satan to learn it through the body of Christ, according to that verse. Not only did I beat you, you're going to have to learn it from this guy that I made out of the dust of the earth. How do you think he feels about that? I mean, basically, you're mud. You're dirt and water, right? And that's who he's, you're, who he's using to replace Satan in the heavenlies. And he doesn't even bother to tell him about it. He says you'll learn it through them. Get Proverbs 25, if you would. And while you're turning there, let me make this point. Notice what these verses tell you about Satan's wisdom. We learned that he was full of wisdom. We learned that he was wiser than Daniel. There was nothing that could be kept from him. But you know what he's most like that we looked at? He's most like that ostrich. Because what happened is, Satan, all the wisdom he had, was still just a created being. And all created beings are 100% dependent upon God for the wisdom and knowledge that they have. They can't figure it out on their own. And what God did, all that wisdom he gave him, he just didn't give him any information about the mystery. And so Satan goes about in his craftiness, and he has this plan, and he's going to manipulate creation to serve him. God never mocks him, never says it's going to fail, just keeps one little secret, then eventually reveals it to Paul, and then Satan sort of realizes, and in the middle of the book of Acts, he says, and I quote, oops, <laughs> that all his plan was for naught, because God kept that secret from him, and all that he did by betraying the Lord Jesus Christ and bringing about the cross, was bring about his own destruction. Let me say one further thing on that before we go on. If you think about Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the way the Bible's laid out, the rest of, of history is about the conflict on earth and heaven. And when you read the Old Testament, what God is doing with Israel, is God going to give Israel a certain specific land? He is. And, and the Old Testament is about the the 
the Old Testament is really about what's going to happen with that land. Is God's purpose with Israel going to be accomplished or is it not? But does the Old Testament say anything about what God's going to do to reconcile the heavens? There's nothing in there. So th- put yourself in Satan's shoes just for a moment, if you would. There's nothing in the Old Testament about how God reconciles the heaven. After Genesis 1, does God create any new angels? He doesn't create any new angels. Can angels reproduce more angels? No. Oh, and by the way, the leading angels, the leading principalities and powers that we read about in Ephesians and Colossians, whose team are they then on after the fall? They're on Satan's side. So Satan looks at it and says, hmm, God's not creating any new angels. Some of the leading ones are on my side. And oh, by the way, although God has his plan to take back the earth, he didn't say anything about the heavens. So you know what? Maybe I got that. Maybe I'll be able to hold on to that. And God doesn't say anything to him about it, just lets him think that. And then in due time, he reveals the apostle Paul, gives him that revelation, and the rest, as they say, is history. Look with me at Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. Amen. And that's exactly what God did with the mystery. Look with me at Isaiah 42. We're almost done, folks. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Verse 11. Uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 48. I was wondering why verse 11 looked strange. Isaiah 48, verse 11. Isaiah 48, verse 11. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Now, here's my point. Proverbs 25 said it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. Isaiah 42 says, and, and 48 both say, my glory will not, I will not give to another. It's not that God is selfish, but it's that the glory that belongs to the Creator God is fundamentally separate, distinct, uniquely belongs to Him, and cannot be shared by any other being because it would be like getting credit for work you didn't do. In other words, it, it, Satan's attempts to obtain God's glory. If you think about Isaiah 14, when he says, I will, I will, I will, I will be like the Most High, and he's going to take God's place. He can't take God's place because God's glory, the things that make God God, his wisdom, his knowledge, his grandeur cannot be accessed by anyone else. Now, we take part in some of that through the body of Christ. Okay, that's a different thing. What I'm saying is Satan's attempts to obtain it for himself are just doomed to failure. They're not going to work. Look with me at Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. What what God did in creating the universe is he created the universe for himself and he created the universe to glorify his son. And what's going to happen with the universe is despite man's or angels or anyone else's attempt to, to manipulate the universe for their own benefit, what's going to happen in the end of time is that the universe is going to be reconciled in Jesus Christ and all glory will go to him. Get with me, if you would, Ephesians 1. So why did God hide the mystery? Well, the reason why he hid the mystery is this. He did it to take the wise in their own craftiness. He did it so that what Satan would do is Satan in his rebellion against God, when he claims that he has the wisdom that he's going to be able to outsmart God, what God does is he keeps just one secret from him. He says, Satan, go do your thing. And what Satan then does is brings about his own destruction. And this demonstrates the truth of 1 Timothy 1.17, that God is in fact the only wise God, and that his purpose in having all creation glorify the Lord Jesus Christ will be accomplished, and no one can thwart it. Look with me at Ephesians 1, verse 9. This is something we can be thankful for. 
Here's what God has done for us today. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. If he didn't tell us, <laughs> we wouldn't know, would we? But he's revealed it to us according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. So we'll spend the rest of the week looking at the mystery, trying to understand it, trying to understand God's purposes for us. Let me just close with, the, with this thought, if I could. If, if you think about what your purpose is here on earth, I think it's, it's really rather simple. 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 tells us that, that God's will for us is first to be saved. If you, if you haven't been saved, if, if you haven't trusted completely in what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you, if you're relying upon your own merit in any sense at all, you need to just quit that because that just that thwarts the grace of God. God will save you when you abandon all hope in yourself and you trust completely in what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you. And once you've resolved that issue, then the, the next issue of life is really simple. It's you want to come to a knowledge of the truth of what right division is, of what God's doing with the mystery. So you might live in a way that you can have a joy and peace and contentment knowing what God's doing and you can do what God would have you to do. One of the things that, that, that's, that's really sad is you can see folks sometimes that have a lot of zeal and they're busy trying to do things that God's not doing. I was in a church years ago where they were teaching a whole bunch of things contrary to the Word of, of God as to what God's doing today. And they were all frustrated because their prayers weren't being answered. And they were frustrated because things weren't happening the way they thought they would. And what they needed to do is they needed to get in this book, understand what God's doing, and then line up their life with what God is doing. Because that's where joy and peace and contentment is. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's going to be good news. We're going to spend eternity together in the body of Christ. Isn't that something? Lord, thank you for this time. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for the truth of the, your, your word. We thank you that salvation is a free gift. We thank you for your great mystery, the body of Christ. We pray that each day we would have a better understanding of it. And we pray that we would walk as the ambassadors that you want us to be. We give all glory to you, God. You are the only wise God. Uh, you are a gracious God who has saved us despite our, our failings. We thank you for all these things. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.